We are then going to uh, start our webinar. Um, I'd like to welcome um, the group workspace uh, managers uh, that are in attendance today, um, the 8th of February, where we would like to share ideas and insights pertaining to the use of uh, group workspace storage within JASMA. Our webinar is going to run as follows. So we'll have an introduction, um, which is going to be handled uh, by uh, Matt Pritchard. Then we're going to look at um, some feedback that we have um, obtained off of the survey that was uh, uh, administered earlier in the year um, and starting off uh, late last year. Then we're going to look at um, concepts and ideas and insights pertaining to why is it that we would like then to have um, um, a clean uh, group workspace in terms of uh, storage. Then we want to look at uh, some of the benefits that we are able to derive if and when we have cleaned up our storage within um, um, Jasmine and the associated group workspaces. After which we then go on and look at um, some of the available tools that will better enable us to be able to monitor the group workspace uh, usage. And um, when it comes to the tools for monitoring, we are then going to have um, uh, Matt Jones and myself being able to assist us in that particular instance. Aside of that, we'll then go on and look at uh, some actionable insights uh, that we can then be able to take in as far as ensuring that um, um, our group workspaces are indeed um, optimal in terms of uh, storage utilization. Then to round off our webinar, we are then going to allow for Q&A right at the end. Of course, as we go through the identified topics there, you are um, allowed to then go on and uh, uh, post your questions within the Q&A section. Um, where in the panelists, which would include uh, Mark Pritchard with me here, who's the uh, Ops Manager. Uh, we also have uh, Alex, um, who is um, a software developer. We've got Matt Jones, who is uh, the DevOps um, engineer. And we also have uh, Fatima, who is also um, there to be able to who provide support for our users. In, the, in attendance, I am noticing also that we've got our director, Adrian Hines, who's also uh, within our panelists. Yep. So I'm going to hand over to uh, Matt Pritchard for introduction. Thank you. Thanks, Charming. And uh, yeah, uh, welcome to everyone. Um, yeah, I'm Matt Pritchard. I'm the um, user services operations manager on the, um, the, if you like, the user facing side of Jasmine. So uh, we're in two teams here in the, at RAL. We have one team within Cedar who, who manage the user facing side of Jasmine. Our colleagues in scientific computing uh, operate all the infrastructure, um, so they're not joining us for this um, this webinar, as far as I'm aware. Um, so it's just uh, it's just half of the Jasmine team, if you like, um, that you'll see today. Um, so we really appreciate your time in joining us for for this um, webinar about uh, uh, improving group workspace management. Um, Jasmine has always been a, a community. It's been in place now for around 12 years, and it's grown significantly over that time. And it's always been a place uh, to work together, both in terms of collaborating for science, but also with the users collaborating with us, the service providers, if you like. And it's a very sort of dynamic um, relationship that's developed, and we really appreciate everyone's help. And we want to try and build um, on that in this activity that we're, we're trying to get underway today. So, um, you know, we're going to provide you with some information but also some tools that enable you to help you as group workspace managers and your, your users. Um, our, our resources in terms of the size of our team and what we're able to do only go so far. So in terms of being able to, to manage those groups of users, those, those projects that you're involved with, and we really do need your help um, in being able to do that. We, we're not able to do all of that work ourselves. So what's, what's this um, event all about? Um, hopefully you'll have all seen the, um, the survey that uh, went out before Christmas. Um, we're not necessarily expecting that all of you have finished that just yet, um, but um, we've got some, some initial results uh, from that, which um, Chami is going to show you. Um, it may be that some of you uh, find some of the information that we, we share with you today useful to, to help you to, uh, complete that survey. That's fine. 
Um, so what's that survey all about, first of all? Well, it's in a way, it's about checking that the information that we have about the, um, all the group workspaces is, is correct and up to date. We've got around, uh, at the last count, um, it's getting on for nearly 400 group workspaces now, um, varying massively in size between a, about a terabyte and about a petabyte. Um, so it's a huge task actually to look after them uh, with obviously quite a small team. Um, and so there's, there's a lot to, to look after. Um, we want to also sort of establish a, a shared understanding about how Jasmine storage is provided. Um, so it's really short term project storage. Um, that's what a group workspace is. Um, it should have an end date. So one key thing that we want to try and get out of, of the survey is updating the information to make sure that all group workspaces have an end date. And it might be that the way the particular project is set up means that that end date is something that needs to be reviewed and renewed at regular intervals. That's fine, but it needs to have an end date. Um, also, the data that's stored uh, within those group workspaces, someone needs to be tasked with, with actively managing that data and ideally the, the group of users that has access to that data as well. It's, it's no longer, well, it's, it's, it's not appropriate for the data to just sit there uh, forever in a group workspace. If data does need to, to reside long-term, um, we've got um, methods and tools and, and systems to, to uh, provide for long-term data curation via data centers such as CEDA, um, so the Center for Environmental Data Analysis, which obviously we're, we're part of as well. Um, there are other data archives as well. But essentially, if it needs to be, um, if it's something that needs to reside there long term, the benefits of going into a data archive would be that it's, it's, it's properly curated, it's in catalogs, it's discoverable, and it has a bunch of data access services that make it available um, more, than, more widely and more, more easily than can be provided through Jasmine itself. So we also want to show you how you can find out some more of this information. So um, about not only what data you've got, but how we introduced the, the sort of concept of hot and cold data. So if you think of hot data as currently being used uh, very regularly, accessed regularly, cold data would be data that is maybe has, has sat there for quite some time, hasn't been accessed for a while. Um, we want to try and minimize the amount of data that's in group workspaces that is sitting there, certainly unmodified, unmodified, but even unaccessed for, for long periods of time. Uh, that's quite a task with, with, with the number and the size of the group workspaces that we have. So this is, this is partly about showing you some tools that we've developed to help you understand um, the sort of heat distribution, if you like, of some of the data in your workspace. Um, and to help you use that information in, in, in addressing uh, how your workspace is used. There's quite a lot of important challenges coming up. Um, cost, energy, carbon usage, these are all really important things. And um, we're, we're trying to make the best use of the expensive resources that, that are provided um, on Jasmine. So there will be more to come in this domain in, in the near future. This is, this is maybe the first webinar just to sort of get this activity started along with the survey. Um, we want to make it easier for, for you also to move data uh, to colder storage and to use that colder storage as part of your workflow. So another thing that we, we will be introducing very shortly is an improvement to the, the tape interface. There's a new service called the Nearline Data Store, NLDS, which will be coming online shortly. Elastic tape, which is Jasmine's tape system, has been around for many years. It's, it's not the easiest thing to use, we acknowledge that. So a lot of work has gone into making the whole process of being able to use that nearline data much more easy. We can't expect you to, to do that unless it's a, an easy and, and um, easy interface and reliable system. So a lot of work has gone into that. You'll hear some of that, about that in due course. Um, and yeah, so after this webinar, do look out for, for further information on our usual sort of comms channels. We may well organize some other webinars um, in, in this area in due course. Um, so yeah, as Chami said, feel free to pop any questions in the Q&A as we, as we go along, and we'll address them in the Q&A section at the end of the webinar. Um, otherwise, I'll hand back to Chami for the rest of the talk. Thank you very much, uh, Matt. Um, 
Like Matt said, if there are any questions, please do feel free to uh, pop them in the Q and A. Now, you will, or you might have uh, received um, a message uh, that uh, requested you then to go on and complete um, um, a survey. And in that survey, there, there are a number of pieces of information that we're trying to um, get from you as group workspace managers. And by interrogating those particular uh, uh, aspects, we want them to gain insights in terms of uh, the usage of the storage that would have otherwise been um, accorded your particular project. And by so doing, we can then go on and better understand the actual utilization or lack of, of that particular resource. Now, from the survey that uh, we um, rolled out, we did discover that in terms of the distribution of the respondents per consortium, you will then realize that um, the uh, Atmos has got uh, the highest number of respondents and uh, followed by um, um, EOCLIM. And uh, we do have a, a distribution across um, the other smaller um, consortium that are provided. And aside of that, it's also important to note that the range in terms of um, uh, group workspace um, size um, is in, in terms of user distribution ranges from one user um, all the way up to 242 users, which is quite, quite um, interesting to note in that we have got group workspaces that have quite a lot of um, users. And that in itself does give us insights in terms of um, utilization of the resource that would have uh, been deployed. So generally, that would be uh, information about the users and, of course, the spread across the consortium. Now, something that is also pretty interesting that uh, we got from um, the survey is an indication that we do have a reasonable amount of uh, users that access the group workspace um, on a daily basis. If you notice in the top left there, we've got a good proportion of users that access the group workspace um, on a daily basis. We also do have um, a proportionally good number of users, again, that access um, the group workspaces on a weekly basis. Um, aside of that, we also got something that is quite interesting in as far as um, the, the last two uh, options, which is uh, cases where the pattern of usage of group workspaces is unknown to the group workspace managers, which is quite interesting, if I may say, Matt. And I think we need to interrogate further and get input and insights from the group workspace managers so that we can better understand um, the, the, the usage patterns that our users are, are actually accessing the group workspaces. And then um, by so doing, we can better understand um, the usage of group workspaces um, in line, of course, with the number and frequency of users for the group workspaces. Another very important um, uh, insight that we obtained from the group workspace uh, manager survey was that the usage of the group workspaces and the pattern against which those uh, usage, that usage uh, is um, an indication, for example, um, users are accessing um, group workspaces for accessing legacy data, for creating new projects, accessing very large projects. Um, and we also do have um, other indications that uh, um, the group workspaces is actually being used for research projects. But one particular aspect that I also found um, to be quite important is that the group workspaces are actually being used for storing um, data sets that can be used in different uh, workflows. Thank you. Now, just a quick look at the distribution in terms of the amount of storage. Uh, and here we're simply going to be looking at the two types of storage, which is your SOF, your um, SMF, and your PFS. Um, you will notice that uh, this particular storage is measured uh, um, in terms of terabytes. Uh, and you will notice that um, for your SOF, you've got one terabyte all the way up to about 433 terabytes in terms of usage. And then we've got um, for your SMF, uh, which uh, ranges between one terabyte and 537. And then for your PFS, we've got a range from 
13 all the way through to 195. Now, this is particularly important in that, depending on the kind of workflow that our users um, or your users are actually accessing the, the storage, it becomes important that uh, you are aware of the type of storage being used, the need for that particular storage, or if there is need to change from one storage to the other, dependent, of course, on the type of uh, workflows that you engage in. Now, another important aspect um, that um, we also interrogated was the fact that um, is the allocated resource in terms of group space resource ideal? Is it what you would have requested or that is it the required storage? Now, in this particular instance, you will notice that the majority of the respondents in this particular survey did indicate that the um, deployed storage is ideal. Um, and that is quite positive. We do have um, a number of respondents who did indicate that um, either um, they're not very aware uh, or um, the, re the deployed storage is not ideal. And as such, it becomes important for us from a user management or user support perspective to then go on and delve and find out why is it that the required storage is not the deployed storage. And we are then going to further interrogate that particular aspect and uh, be able to address that. Now, there are a number of comments that were also indicated in terms of uh, what group workspaces are, are used for. Um, and in that particular instance, you will notice that a number of users did indicate that uh, they are using um, group workspaces to be able to manage their projects. They are using, um, or they would like then in some instances to be able to use uh, your PANDF. They would like then to be able to use their group workspaces, group workspaces for much larger projects. But aside of that, we also did indicate that, sort of got indication that some group workspace managers would like the amount of uh, group, sorry, the amount of storage for their group workspaces to be extended. And that in itself um, is a good indication uh, that um, the group workspaces are indeed being used and uh, the storage therefore um, that would have been deployed is being used and we can therefore be able to uh, address any needs and, and address any use cases that would have been highlighted. Now, just a quick look at some of the scenario, usage scenarios that um, our group workspaces are actually being used for. Now, it's important to note that um, Jasmine um, is being used by many, many um, uh, domains in terms of uh, usage scenarios, such as um, the consortia that we have, which would include for atmospheric science workflows, um, your, 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 your cross-cutting activities, your ecology, earth observation, just to mention, but some um, that are actually listed within that particular slide. Now, added to that, there's been an indication, um, and um, the indication does point to the fact that there is need then to be able to engage other domains in as far as uh, extending um, the support and the domains that uh, group workspaces can therefore be able to provide so that we can extend the type of workflows, the type of data that is stored, and of course, uh, other aspects that uh, go hand in hand with um, 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 needs that exist within and within the country, within the organization, and of course, uh, any other needs that might arise. Okay. Now, just a quick look at uh, some of the benefits that we will be able to derive, and I know uh, Matt has already highlighted some of these. Um, it's important to note that we would like then to clean up our group workspaces. And cleaning up in this particular instance simply refers to the fact that any data that would be derived either from collection or um, as, as, as being output from our workflows that is no longer being accessed needs to be either stored away within archive or if it is no longer in use, then as group workspace managers, it becomes important for you to make a decision in terms of what would you like to do with that particular data. 
Do you want the data to be available to other domains? Of course, remembering the fact that our projects are funded, and if they are funded, there's some output that is required. And that particular output uh, might be that the, the, the results of your project must be available uh, within the public domain so that others can then also be able to use it for um, um, other projects, other research, amongst many others. It also becomes important that we are able to manage that data effectively and optimally. But aside of that, we also want to ensure that the data that um, is no longer being accessed needs to be securely stored away and our archive is such a tool. Now, there's, there's a term that is used, um, referred to as data deduplication, which is simply an approach that is used, especially in environments where data is shared. And Jasmine is one um, example. We might have a case where the raw data that has been obtained from some particular uh, uh, um, uh, research, raw data that is coming either from atmospheric um, um, equipment or any other such type of equipment, and that data is then being used, it has been imported into um, other services. We want them to reduce the amount of duplicate data that exists within Jasmine. And that can be achieved by um, through the use of deduplication. And this is actually a result um, of cleaning up our group workspaces. Now, the solution, therefore, to address this is to be able to move data that has not been accessed um, in, in the recent time, maybe five years, but of course, I, I need to highlight very quickly here that the amount of time that would have elapsed since the data was accessed is going to be relative in terms of the type of project, um, the, the, the type of workflows that you engage in. And as a result, this might not um, be that for each project, five years is the maximum in terms of time. That may vary depending, of course, on the project that you are engaging in. And as a result of that, we'd like them to be able to reduce the cost, reduce the energy associated with storing the data within the group workspaces. And the reason for that is the group workspaces use your spinning disks, which use energy. And when we move the data to archive, which uses your tape, um, then we are going to reduce the amount of uh, energy that is going to be consumed. Right, um, I would like us then to go on and look at two tools that we can be able to use in terms of uh, getting an indication in as far as the usage of our group workspaces. Now, the first point of call would be navigating to our project portal. Now, I'm sure this might, be, might sound redundant, but as group workspace managers, it's important that we are able to navigate to our projects um, portal. And once you've navigated to your project portal, you then need to be able to um, sign in, of course, with your Jasmine account. Uh, and once you've done that, you would then be able to identify the group workspaces, sorry, the projects that are associated with your username. Of course, this would have been requested through, of course, the uh, appropriate um, um, workflows that are available for us in terms of requesting uh, for resources for our projects. Now, from there, you'll be able to identify the projects that are available for you. You'll also be able to see the state of your particular projects. And then secondly, you'll also be able to see the requirements which um, translate to services that would have requested, which could either be compute services, these could be storage services, that you might have requested um, um, that um, you would like your project to be afforded. Now, aside of that, you also notice that you'll also be able to see any individuals that are either owners, sorry, end owner or collaborators within your project um, as a group workspace manager, and you can then be able to further manage um, those particular collaborators for your project. Now, once you've navigated to um, the project portal, you will be able to, one, identify the name of your project. 
you also, from the overview tab, which is uh, indicated by arrow um, one there, you'll be able to get a quick overview of what has happened in terms of um, um, changes that would have been applied to your group workspace. Secondly, you will also be able to see the um, services associated with your group workspace, which you're going to see in the next slide. But aside of that, you will also be able to see any other um, sorry, users and collaborators associated with that particular group workspace. Now, in, most importantly for group workspace managers would be the associated services that your group workspace has been afforded. Now, in this case, if you notice, we are using um, group workspace uh, named CEDAR PROC. And in this case, CEDAR PROC has got tape that has been allocated, um, your um, edge post storage, uh, we also have uh, your soft storage that has also been provisioned for this particular group workspace. Aside of that, you'll also be able to see the location, which would be the path um, that your storage, in this case for your soft, which would be your GWS forward slash uh, um, NOPW, and then you'll be able to identify the actual path associated with um, your storage. And then for your... Edge post, which is your, your, your Karingo uh, object store, you then have a URL associated with it, and you can then be able to use that particular URL to then access uh, your storage. But most importantly, you also be able to see the amount of provisioned storage for each one of the services that you've been afforded. Now, of importance then is you need to be able to align the provision storage and the requested storage, and those two must align. Okay. Right, I think we can go to the next one. All right. Right. Um, what is important also is that as group workspace managers, you will also be able to, to view the, the services that you are able to access. Now, these are only going to be available if you've indeed made a request to access that particular service. And in green, within the slide that you're looking at, you will then get an indication of whether you are accessing that particular resource as a user or if you're accessing that particular resource as a manager. In, your, in this case, we hope that you'll be accessing all the group workspaces or all the services that are provided in here as, um, as managers. Of course, uh, with the exception of others, such as your login servers, managers for login servers would be the uh, Jasmine management team. This is the account so, oh, oh, yes, yes, yes. Um, thank, thanks for, for, for that particular correction. Um, for you then to be able to um, manage the services associated with your group workspaces, this is going to be available for you from the um, accounts uh, portal. All right. Secondly, from within your accounts portal, you'll also be able to determine the users within your, um, your group workspace. You'll also be able to see the, any pending requests that you might have made. You'll also be able to grant or revoke any roles within your group workspace, allowing or disallowing users to be able to access your particular group workspace and the associated service in your group workspace. Base. Added to that, I think it's also important when you navigate further within the tabs that are available for you, which we had numbered one through to five in the previous slide. Now, you will be able to identify any of your users within your group workspace by name. And you'll also be able to um, identify whether that particular user is active or not. Um, if you notice right at the bottom there, we do have one particular user who's no longer active. And this gives you, as a group workspace manager, an indication of whether a user is indeed supposed to be accessing the group workspace or not. If you don't find them there, then you therefore need to be able to grant them access to the group workspace um, that um, you would be accessing. Um, aside of that, I think it's also important to note that you have the ability to filter depending on, on what um, property 
or what characteristic or attribute about your user you would like them to view. You can be able to filter by role, which is either if you want to only view users, if you want to view users that have got deputy or manager roles, you can be able to apply those particular filters. Aside of that, you can also be able to apply filters such as in cases where you only want to view your active users, or if you want to view um, users that have got roles that have been revoked or expired, you can therefore use the checkboxes there to be able to filter um, your um, displayed users. Right. The next thing that we'd like then to look at would be another tool that is available for us, which is the Group Workspace uh, Scanner. Now, just a bit of background here. Now, like Matt indicated earlier on, we would like to get an indication as group experts, not managers, uh, we would like to get an indication as to the usage of an identified resource within um, um, Jazzby. Now, having said that, there is a tool um, known as a group a scanner, which is available on the URL that is indicated there, which is your gws-scanner.jasmine.ac.uk. Again, you need to be able to sign in there using your Jasmine user account. And once you've signed in, you will then uh, be able to, of course, dependent on the permissions accorded of you, you'll then be able to view the available um, group workspaces once you've clicked on the arrow marked as five, which gives an indication of all the group workspaces that you, um, you have permissions to be able to view. Now, once you have um, signed in and you have uh, clicked on my group workspaces, you are then going to get a listing of the group workspaces that are available for you. And you will notice that you're going to get the name of the particular group, uh, group workspace or service, and you're also going to get the location in terms of the path for the associated storage there. Now, at this point, you then need to make a decision as to which of the group workspaces or which of the services would you like them to view the storage utilization. And once you've uh, identified which um, service you'd like to access, all you then to do is to click on the location, which is actually uh, associated with a link. It's actually provided as URL in there. It will then immediately um, display um, a graph that gives you an indication of the hit. Now, just a quick one here in terms of uh, what we mean by hit. Now, if you remember earlier on, Matt did indicate that we're going to be using terms such as hot or cold. And what we're simply indicating here is that we would like to get an indication as to how long has the data within your group workspace or within your service, um, has the data remained unaccessed? Or when was the data indeed last accessed? And by identifying that, we can, if I can use the term, be able to find or get an indication as to the age of the data, um, or sorry, not the age, but uh, um, access, the last access time for our data. And that in itself then tells us as group workspace managers, um, to some extent, which data is old. And if it is old, do we need to keep it within um, Jasmine? Remember when we said earlier on that Jasmine uses or spinning disks, we therefore need to go on and identify which of this data. And within your um, group workspace scanner, you will then be able to get an indication as to what data in terms of um, the type of files, you'll also be able to um, see and uh, get a distribution of your data either by user, you also be able to get a distribution of your data by file type, and you also be able to get a distribution of your data or an indication of um, the distribution of your data by hit. So what this then is going to give you an indication in that to the far right, which is uh, marked by arrow six, you're going to get an indication of the amount of data that was last accessed in between one to two years, two to five years, 
more than five years and so on and so forth. And that in itself indicates to you that there is data that has remained dormant within group workspaces and then you need to you know, further interrogate that data and see whether it needs to be moved to archive. Now, interestingly also is that you also be able to get an indication as to the amount of data or the amount of storage that each of your users is actually um, using within your service. And that in itself, again, adds to the information that you can then use to be able to further gain insights in terms of uh, storage utilization. Now, having said that, just a quick look at um, the distribution in terms of um, uh, our data um, picked up from the previous uh, slide, you will get an indication that within the entirety of our group workspace, um, by the way, this is data that is obtained, uh, um, obtained as of December. Now, there is an indication that we have got a reasonable amount of data that is to the far left, that is about uh, five years old, uh, or was last accessed five years ago. And of importance from this particular slide is that we have got data that um, the, the most data within our group workspaces was last accessed uh, between one and two years. And we therefore need as group workspace managers to you know, interrogate our data and our users and be able to identify um, the data that we therefore need to move to archive. Now, having said that, I'm going to then hand over to Matt Jones. Thanks, Jamie. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, the Jasmine dashboard, which we've um, re recently updated. Um, we've changed this to hopefully make it more um, user-friendly and to have a bit more of an oversight of, of what exactly um, is on this dashboard. So um, if you get, Matt, can you go on to the next bit? Because the green box isn't showing. There we go. So um, the dashboard exists at one.jasmine.ac.uk, um, which is the same as the previous dashboard, but it, it, it'll look slightly different. You now have to log in using your Jasmine credentials. After you uh, have logged in, you'll hit the home page, which is shown on the right. Um, and then if we can go to the next slide, please. So uh, there's a few things to note about the home page. Um, on the right-hand side with the arrow with one is a link to the other available dashboards, uh, which all uh, show different information. Um, uh, to navigate back to this home page, you, you click the... Um, orange swirl in the top left, uh, and you can do that from whatever page you're on on the dashboard. Um, and then um, just to, to, to point out here as well, there is a link to the Jasmine's status page here as well. Um, next slide, please. So um, here we've gone into the group workspace dashboard. So there's a, a few things to note here. Um, on this dashboard, it gives an overview of the the overall provision and usage of um, the group workspace. So, um, on um, the, the arrow two, um, you you can select the group workspace, and this um, that produces a drop down box of all of the group workspaces. Um, you can also type into this box so you don't have to scroll through. Um, and then arrows three and four allow you to specify exactly what group workspace that you want to see. So um, most of the time you won't need to use this because uh, it will show the page will show all of them. Um, but it is a handy way to view what paths are available under this group workspace. And I should say at this point that this um, isn't just available to um, managers of the group workspace, that this is any Jasmine user. Um, and then we have an example plot on the right from this page. Um, the, uh, there's something to highlight here, which is in the green circle. So because um, of how the data is collected and, and displayed, sometimes there are erroneous um, peaks and troughs 
so for example here on the on the 21st of january i there are actually um mistakenly three collections and uh, of the data um and because of how how, how that's plotted uh, it shows an artificial peak um we are trying to deal with these when we can um but uh that there will occasionally be some things like this so we can go on to the next slide please so there are other um dashboards available apart from the group workspace one we have one on the power usage of jasmine which um uh, uh uh, shows overall plot uh, overall power consumption plots and also grouped by the type of server for instance storage or compute and the phase of jasmine as well which is the 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 normally the year in which that bit of jasmine was bought um i've also re recently re-implemented the lotus status page from the old dashboard which allows you um uh uh, a near real-time view of um, what, how many jobs are running, pending, and, and completing, for example, in Lotus. This is up, uh, updated, I think, every five minutes. The power is updated every hour, and the group workspace usage is, is updated every day. So there are plans to include uh, quite a lot more um, on this dashboard. So um, the next things that are being work, worked on are um, the SMS, SNF, the SSD storage, which groups have, and the high performance object store as well. Um, it'll also uh, include uh, scratch usage after the SSD um, metrics are available. Um, and Jasmine notebook metrics are also being um, worked on currently. Um, and then we plan to um, expand this into um, metrics on Lotus, um, on the Jasmine users and cloud uh, and more. So hopefully this is a useful tool for all Jasmine users and especially for group workspace managers. I think that's uh, my slides. Okay. Thank you very much, Matt. Um, I think after what we've looked at um, so far uh, in terms of uh, the introduction, the tools that we have, the need for um, cleaning up our corporate spaces, I think our takeaways from that is that we need as group workspace managers then to be able to one, identify where the files are located within group of spaces. Secondly, in some instances, we would like to be able to identify which users are using what amount of storage um, within our group of spaces. Of course, um, I say that, but it's all going to be dependent on the kind of workflows and the kind of projects that each of the users, uh, your users are actually using. Now, added to that, we also then need to be able to identify the hit we did explain what our hit um, is an indication of. And from that point, you can then make a decision as group of space managers with the available tools to then move your data from your um, Jasmine, which is your spinning disk, into archive with the current tools that are available and um, the new tools that are also going to be introduced in the future. And what's important to take away also is that if and when there is a need to move data from the, um, um, the spinning disks off of which your soft SMF and so on are currently uh, resident in, and you are not aware of the tools and how to achieve that, it's important then to raise a ticket and then the Jasmine team will then be able to assist you in terms of uh, achieving that. Having said that, I would like then to allow for us then to um, look at, at some of the questions if they've not been answered. Um, um, but before we do that, I think um, we also do have some links in terms of uh, documentation 
and uh, URLs that you can then be able to use in terms of accessing your group workspace scanner, um, being able to access um, the status of Jasmine. We do have those tools and we have added um, some of those URLs within that particular slide. Now, having said that, uh, Max, you want to say something? Okay, yeah, so um, thanks, Chami. Um, Alex, I guess you, you, if you've been watching the questions as, as they've been coming in, um, do you want to sort of pick out uh, what um, a few questions for, for us to address? Yeah, uh, there, I mean, to be fair, there haven't been that many, and a few we've been on, a few have been answered. I guess it was probably just worth highlighting. Um, there was a question about what the difference between SMF and PFS is that Matt answered. Um, but I can just, uh, so SMF is small file storage. That's SSDs for groups which are mainly used for like Python virtual environments and small software. And PFS is parallel file system, which is needed for parallel writes. Um, that's needed because the scale out file system doesn't do true parallel writes. So these are terms that we kind of band around, but just to highlight that that's what they are. Um, and then a good one that a lot of people have kind of agreed with is Tristan said, as a group workspace manager, they can't delete data placed on the space by other users. So where we have users that are unresponsive or have left, we can't clean up the disk. Um, okay. is, is there any yeah, solution to this? Let me pick that one up. That's, that's something we've um, we've been thinking about for a while, and, and I think finally we're, we're we're planning to get this underway as a tool to be able to enable the group workspace manager to request ch owning, you know, changing the ownership of um, particular directories and files. So particularly, yeah, in that case where a user has left, um, you know, it may be the case that just that that entire directory tree can just be deleted. Um, but also, it's it's good if the group workspace manager can can do that action themselves. But in order to do that, we need to change the ownership of that data back to the group workspace manager. Now, if you've got a real need to do that, the, the simple answer for now is to um, uh, email support at Jasmine, and, and we can arrange that for you. But what we're what we're planning is a tool that enables that. And we have to be a bit careful with this because that is a, that is a task with elevated sort of access permissions and stuff. So we want to encapsulate that in an interface that you can then use to invoke that task in a secure way. Um, so that, that is definitely on our to-do list. We plan to introduce that um, sometime soon. I can't give you an exact date for it just yet because there's a few technicalities to work out. Um, but we, we had a meeting about that exact thing the other day. Um, so yeah, it's definitely on our list. Um, All right. So I wonder if there's um... a... Another one, a very a more of a quick one. How do you decide which consortium a project goes to? Um, is it yeah, up essentially to... they're, they're organized by um, broadly science domains. Um, it, it should be relatively... Um, the, uh, the example given is uh, they make observations of clouds at the poles. Which domain do they go <laughs> in? <laughs> yeah, the clouds are always a tricky one. Um, and uh, yeah, some of them obviously fall between uh, different consortia. Um, I guess the answer is it has to fall somewhere. So it, it could be a conversation between the, uh, the Jasmine team and the different consortium managers to, to, to find the, the appropriate home for it if it's not immediately obvious. But um, yeah, so essentially the, the, the purpose of the consortia, if you're not aware, is to, um, is to, to carve up the, the overall capacity and resources of Jasmine into um, allocations for, for different communities. You see those communities are of different sizes. We've got some very big communities, some smaller ones. Um, and we review those regularly to try and make sure that the different communities are provided with appropriately sized resources on Jasmine, um, uh, you know, to, to, to what they're, they're currently undertaking as a all the, the, the size and scale of the projects in that community. Um, so yeah, sometimes there's a bit of negotiation and sometimes uh, they don't fall into any of those, so we've got some some extra ones for sort of directors cross cutting activities, or there's the national public good for things that really don't don't sit comfortably in any of those. So if you're unsure, just get in touch, and we can help advise on that. Uh, somebody, Milan Lezecki says in their workflow they process new data by algorithm that loads large amounts of core data stored on the soft disk. Um, but they first 
copy it to scratch because SOF is not recommended for processing. Um, they speak of tens of terabytes of core data, which repeats fortnightly. Um, and they want to know if that's still a good idea, whether they could keep the core data on scratch indefinitely rather than flood the SI servers with he heavy copy copying or maybe just use it straight from the SOF. Yeah, I think for, for, for certain um, workflows where uh, obviously the, the scratch storage is, is like sort of, you know, uh, high performance, parallel capable output storage for, for when people are running jobs on Lotus. So uh, what we want to try and do is preserve as much of that as possible for, for, to be available for people's, um, you know, work. Um, so it's it's not the best place for data to, to reside for long periods of time. So I think if you've got workflows where there's the likelihood of data building up in, in Scratch, uh, do, do get in touch and we'll see if we can work out um, a, a better allocation of storage for you. It might be that we, we can we can make some special arrangement or whether we can... Uh, there's also the Jasmine Transfer Cache, XFC, which some of you might be aware of. Um, where you can self-provision um, you know, a certain amount of space. Um, so there are other solutions, but I would say Scratch particularly is somewhere that um, we don't want data sitting long-term. I think there's automated clear-out procedures that kick in after 90 or 180 days, I think. Um, so that's not somewhere to keep data long-term, definitely. All right. Um, Declan asked... Are there any plans to help facilitate a backup approach for data on the group workspaces? When the process data is being produced, it'd be nice to have a backup for the while, for while it exists in the group workspace, um, but perhaps the NLDS will make this easier. And I'm just going to say after this question, if you can do the question speaking, Fatima, because I've got to go. Yeah, I can do it. Thanks. Okay, so yeah, um, backup's always been a tricky question for, for Jasmine. Um, the, the CEDAR archive, which is hosted on Jasmine, is backed up. Um, that's a long-term archive, and there's, a, there's a, a secondary and even a tertiary copy of that. Um, however, it's almost impossible for us to uh, undertake a backup service for um, the group workspaces, partly because of the variety of, of scales, the different workflows people people use, the time scales that people work on. Um, so a centralised backup um, service is, is not really something that's possible within the current resources that we have for Jasmine. Um, that's, that's always been the case. Um, having said that, um, there are two things to note. One is that, uh, yeah, with, with the, the Nearline storage, uh, originally with Elastic Tape and soon to be with Near, Nearline Data Store, the ability to, to do those kind of um, copies of, of data yourself should become a lot easier. Um, the, the, one of the big advantages of the Nearline data store is that it has a large front-end object storage cache. So it's disk, but it's a different type of disk to the disk that you're working on in your group workspace. Um, so pushing data to the NLDS will eventually result in it going to tape, but for quite a while it, it resides on disk. But that's okay, if you like, because at least for that time, it's a second copy of it. You would need to manage that, that yourself, though. That's the important thing. Um, the second thing is... Um, the, uh, the SMF group workspaces. So uh, if you've been allocated or if you're interested in requesting one of these solid state storage areas for your group workspace, normally we give these out in chunks of 100 gigabytes. Essentially, it's like a home directory, but for your project. So it's ideal for um, small files, uh, whether it's uh, Python environments or code, that sort of thing. The sorts of things that are edited regularly and, and disastrous to lose, um, those are... Uh, backed up in the same way that the home directories are, so with, with these rolling snapshots. So if you've, if you've got sort of, um, you may be aware from your home directory that if you accidentally delete something, you can, if you look in the documentation for snapshot backups, you can find out how to self-restore your, uh, whatever it was you deleted from uh, the last snapshot, which might have been yesterday or up to two weeks ago, I think, uh, you can restore. And the same process applies to the, um, uh, small files group workspaces. It's for those small data. We, we can do it on that scale. What we can't do is, is the multi-terabyte, multi-petabyte backups because um, we don't have twice the amount of Jasmine storage or the, or the, the systems to manage that. So uh, limited backup. 
it should be worth just repeating that, yeah, in general, Jasmine Group workspaces are not backed up. So if you want, if it's important to you to do that, make sure you take some action, either using the existing elastic tape or, or when the NLDS comes into play, or just take a copy of it elsewhere um, for, for those really important bits, um, particularly of the code that generated the data, perhaps at least allow you to regenerate some of it. Okay, so uh, the next question is about um, the elastic tape servit being uh, not very reliable due to outage times or sometimes for a week, and some users are hesitant to archive their data to elastic tape. So it's um, is there how how can you make this service? Is it possible to make it more reliable? Okay, yeah, I mean um, the, we're we're aware that the the um both the sort of, you know, the interface to use Elastic Tape and the service of Elastic Tape as well is, is not optimal. Um, it's something that we really are addressing, hoping to address with the, the NLDS service. Um, inevitably, however, you know, this is, this is a question that applies to the whole of Jasmine. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a community platform. It's a cutting edge research platform. It's not um, an enterprise um, system, so it's not you know 24, 365 available. Um, so a certain amount of uh, fault tolerance and, and building the, the sort of possibility of, of outage and delays into your workflows is, is definitely worthwhile. Um, there will always be unexpected outages. There will always be scheduled outages as well. Um, we, we do our best now with the, um, the CEDA status page to, to um, try and keep uh, a current view of what the, the current incidents are, to try and keep you informed about what, you know, what those are and, and, and what their status is in terms of being resolved. So uh, do try and use those resources to, to keep yourself informed. Um, yeah, all I can say is I, uh, I think we're, we're, we're quietly confident that the NLDS should be a step change in, in um, in, in both performance and reliability and ease of use uh, compared to elastic tape. But uh, I guess we'll see. Thank you, Matt. I don't see any other question. I think. Uh... Okay, I guess we're, we're coming oh. to the top of the hour now again. So um, maybe uh, what we'll do is as a team is, is gather up any remaining questions into a document and perhaps address those um, and, and reply uh, in, in, uh, uh, as part of a news item perhaps. Um, so, yeah, I guess it just falls to me to, to thank everyone for, for attending. As I say, there may well be more um, sort of information gathering, information sharing exercises that happen in this particular space around the group workspaces in, in due course. So please do, do watch this space. But yeah, thank you. Thank you all very much for attending. We really appreciate your time and your help in helping us make the best use of uh, Jasmine resources. So, uh, yeah, thanks very much. Thank you very much. Um... That brings us to the end of our webinar. Um, and thanks again. Look out for any news items. Thank you and bye-bye for now. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everyone.